next speakers, Megan E. Norris and Tara A. Karasevich. They will be speaking about taking a proactive approach, navigating student accommodations. Hello, everybody. Um, I am so glad to be here. For those who don't know me, I actually started my undergraduate training here over 20 years ago now. Um, I'm not sure how, because none of us have aged any in 20 years, <laughs> um, but we sure learned a lot together. Um, I, when I finished my undergrad degree, I went on to graduate school. I was a professor for a while at Purdue University in the States. And um, then I was back in Halifax for a while. And now I teach and work as the undergraduate chair of psychology at Queen's University. And so I'm going to talk a little bit today about just some of the work we've done in terms of accommodations at Queen's. One of the things that I find really helpful about my career and the zigs and zags that I didn't expect it to have, but it did, was that I've had a lot of experience working in different systems. And at the end of the day, we all operate in systems. Sometimes systems are good, sometimes systems are bad, but we all have opportunities to make change in systems. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. I do have slides, um, but I also really want to work to bring us together after lunch. Um, so to our colleagues and friends who are online, we're going to get you kind of up and moving a little bit. Um, for those in here, I'm going to get you up and moving a little bit. And just like my students, everybody is cringing as I say that. But I promise it will be okay and we'll have some fun together. Thank you. I'm going to keep my mask on. Um, but you can like assume I have a big smile underneath. Usually, usually I do. So thank you again for letting me be here today. So today I want to talk about some real barriers in terms of systems. Um, I have another talk where I really make a case for the importance of public higher education and how it leads to better society. I'm going to take for granted that we all buy into that here. Um, higher education is associated with a slew of positive outcomes across the board. And when we have barriers that don't need to be there, we've got a problem. I'm also going to talk about some of the kind of systemic issues we're all in. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about um, the Nova Scotia system and probably a lot about the Ontario system that I'm coming from um, because there are important differences there. So from Nova Scotia, um, post-secondary accessibility framework, I want to take time to read this out just again to highlight perspectives with respect to accessibility. Access to education is a human right, and Nova Scotia's post-secondary sector is committed to ensuring access for persons with disabilities and others who experience barriers to accessibility, such as those who identify as deaf or neurodivergent. Accessibility is a collaborative process requiring participation from all stakeholders. I'm going to say here, um, invested parties in terms of thinking about language and modifying language. Um, departments, faculty, staff, students, and partners. It requires understanding the barriers persons with disabilities face accessing education and committing to prevent and remove them through the proactive design and revision of programs, policies, practices, services, and infrastructure. As a body on the ground working in this, this takes time, effort, care, a whole lot of resources. It's needed, it's necessary, and I also want to recognize that we are all individuals working in a space, um, and this can sometimes be really challenging, especially if you have other tasks and duties that you're working on. Something I really appreciate about the Ontario approach to accommodations in post-secondary is that just as equal to what happens in terms of providing accommodation is the process by which you get there. So from Human Rights Ontario, a failure to give any thought or consideration to the issue of accommodation, including what, if any, steps could be taken, constitutes a failure to satisfy the procedural duty to accommodate. So it is not just about the accommodation that's implemented, it's about the care and the thought and the investment in the process to get there. Megan, yes. I ask you a quick question about that definition. I hate to get away with this. Totally. Please pause. 
Thank you. You, okay, sorry. So I find that definition very interesting, if not problematic. So yeah. it says a failure to give any thought. Yeah. So does that that implies a very low bar? So I think a challenge in this space is that there are vague and fuzzy definitions. The approach that we're taking and the approach I'm going to show you today is that it's actually a lot of thought. And so because that's the right thing to do, right, at the end of the day, and so, you know, I hope that we're going to do better than law. If you want to get into what is precedent, I mean, I think that's a good question. And I think it's fuzzy and not very well leaned into. We're going to throw this package in. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to take the position that we must ensure access to equitable learning experiences not just because it's the legal thing to do, but because it's the right thing to do, because it's associated with a lot of positive outcomes. Ultimately, as instructors, it is our goal to have students able to participate in courses. Language that Queens is starting to adopt um, is that, you know, we have these learning outcomes and we can talk about learning outcomes and pros and cons of them, but it's really important that we communicate what is essential in our courses. So for example, a kind of common um, example that's talked about is if you have a music class and it's like an orchestra type of class and you go in and you take a seat um, as somebody who can play the clarinet, it's not a learning outcome that you play the clarinet, but it is an essential requirement for you to participate that you can play the clarinet. Embedded in our curriculum are lots of these essential requirements that we may or may not make explicit. We want to think about what is essential. So for example, if you're teaching a fourth year seminar course and an oral presentation is required, that oral presentation is essential. But there's ways that we can have oral presentations that may not mean standing up in front of a class. Maybe it's recording something, maybe it's putting something online, maybe it's uh, leveraging ed tech like Flipgrid, uh, but thinking about how we can accommodate for those essential requirements. And there will be times when accommodation may not be possible based on an essential requirement. If that is the case, we need to justify why and how we have thought about it. And this is where those conversations really come into play as being really important. So oftentimes students and others may have better insight into how to accommodate than we do. I also want to acknowledge that we are facing a little bit of attention as we modernize teaching. So from the ed cog literature, we know best practices in teaching and learning for long term memory are to have increased frequency of assessment, to have increased contact, lots of feedback, we're doing tons of formative assessment, um, increased frequency of group presentations. All of this increased contact is also happening at a time when we see rates of disability in uh, post-secondary increasing. And the nature of disability is changing as we um, support students who have disability. Um, learning disability, the mental health disabilities are two of the fastest growing categories of disability in post-secondary and they can often be episodic. And for anybody who you know, has experienced stress um, and stress-related outcomes like midterms and finals, when we have lots of high stakes summative assessments are challenging, right? So how do we then think about maximizing pedagogy based on what we know is best for long-term memory and also reducing barriers for students to engage? It's this that I'm really gonna lean into today with you. Again, we're going to workshop this a little bit. Um, and I'm going to introduce you to one approach for supporting students and instructors in the con in the context of thinking about essential requirements. Here's what I'm going to say, and I know this is being recorded. Um, I'm really hoping in 10 years, we can look back at this talk and I'm going to be mortified at what I am suggesting. This is one imperfect start to an area that is growing. We are learning all of the time. What I have, I don't link it here, but I can link it. Um, the model I'm gonna show you today that we're, we're implementing 
we've actually published through OSF and it's available on Google Sheets with the intention of bringing in more perspectives so that we can all learn and grow together. And so that people can be like, what are you thinking? This is absolutely not going to work. Please tell us. The goal is to make a more accessible and inclusive system. And so, you know what? Let's make some mistakes and fail fast so that we can do better. Okay. As we think about accessibility in the classroom, we have to recognize that we work in a series of systems, sometimes that are multiple pay grades above us, and we may not be able to change everything up there. Um, the Maritime Provinces Higher Education Commission Degree Level Qualifications Framework provides, so see here's where you're gonna shout out, can you now see a web page? We've got um, in Nova Scotia, these degree level outcomes. I'm not sure the degree to which these are very salient in the Nova Scotia higher ed system. Nova, uh, Ontario has these, um, we call them UDLEs, undergraduate degree level expectations, and they are very front of mind in terms of how we have to develop and deliver our programs. So these have taken a very central role in terms of articulating um, program level expectations. Different provinces will have these grids with different degree level expectations. In um, a design type of framework, I'm going to say ideally in quotes here, you've got these you know, provincially mandated outcomes. Universities may have outcomes embedded in that then you might have departmental level expectations down to the course level. So again, you've got these degree level expectations that sit on top of program level learning outcomes. And then at the course level, we've got instructors who are asked to come up with course level learning objectives. And sometimes people have guidance on creating these, sometimes they don't. Sometimes depending on your institution, you inherit these learning outcomes and the systems don't allow you to go in and tweak. And so we live with them. But they may communicate things to our students that either we want to communicate or we may not want to. So thinking about the fact that an individual course and instructor operates under these systems, there's also university variance in terms of systems. So at Queen's, what happens is students will go to a central accessibility office where they will be provided with a letter of accommodation. That letter of accommodation tells us some pretty generic things. So it may say, you know, extra 15 minutes per hour for assessment. And we can never ask students why that's in place to be able to design an individual system for that student at that level of knowledge. This is actually in place for a really good reason. It's there to protect student privacy and to protect student health information but it does create challenges for instructors who are like, oh, I can think of a million ways to, to help here. I don't know how to start. Queens also has a very different kind of structure in terms of volume. So thinking that our goal is to again, increase accessibility and also reduce workload for instructors who are not trained in disability management. Um, you know, They're not, they're trained in their area of expertise um, and TAs, graduate students, undergraduate TAs also are not generally trained in terms of disability management. Um, the workload, which is outside of scope and large, can be challenging. So in psychology alone, um, we timetable 10,000 undergraduate seats in psychology. Pulling from the literature, if we want to assume about 20% of those students will have at least one type of accommodation. And assuming that you might have three assessments per course, this means that we are working to accommodate 6,000 students in terms of adjustments to their assignments. Not only that, this is 6,000 times that a student may have to jump through hoops to try to get paperwork, to try to communicate when things are going on. So, wow, we've got a big opportunity to kind of like, let's just bring this down for everybody and also open doors for everybody. The system I'm going to talk about is, first of all, not going to be perfect for everybody. It is a way to reduce some of the barriers. Um, in, uh, accommodation is an individualized process. This is not going to take away the need for discussions, but it's hopefully going to take down some of the need for some of those discussions 
just going to make it easier for students. So this model is tweakable from a systems level. So again, I'm going to use language that's probably queen centric and I apologize. Um, it's what I know best right now. Um, but you'll see how this can be tweaked across courses and institutions and departments. So the change for instructors, and it's going to seem super small, but it's kind of big, is that you should be thinking about accommodating students before your semester ever starts, before you ever make your syllabus, before you think about your assessments. That means in the summer, this is when this work is happening for many of us. The goal of designing with accessibility in mind means that we're designing ahead of time. Y'all, midterms is busy and stressful for everybody. We know that we're not very creative. We can't come up with creative problem solving when we're all maybe a bit burnt out on the edges. Thinking about this ahead of time can help us build the system in a way that supports everybody. I also thinking about this ahead of time, we can communicate with students who are in our courses who may need accessibility, either through an accommodation system or otherwise, because everybody has had something happen, you know, a loved one dies, um, car accident, whatever, we can communicate about flexibility up front, so that when you're dealing with an event of various types, you don't have to think about another process you need to go through. So again, um, I have a letter, you can tweak it if you're interested in it, um, but our goal is to think about designing ahead of time so that mid-course we're not running into challenges. Okay, you getting ready for the workshop spot? It's coming up. So I want you to think about the systems that you operate in. And if you're a student, I want you to pick a course that you've taken um, that you either think works really well for you or maybe that there's some opportunities to, to change. Think about degree level expectations that you may be operating under, program or department outcomes that you're expected to operate under, and then course level learning outcomes. I also encourage you to think about, and this varies a lot between institutions, um, course learning hours. So at Queen's, one semester course is 120 learning hours. So we might have three in person, you need to then have you know about another seven hours of work per week to meet the ministry mandated um, learning hour outcome. How your workflow breaks down, whether it's a three hour session, whether it's one and a half hour session, and then thinking about assessments. Um, a question that often comes up is how much work is too much? Just to throw this on your radar. Um, Rice came up with a really great, again, there's always assumptions built into systems like this, but if you're trying to budget, wow, you know, how much time am I giving my students in terms of reading? You can go in here and throw in pages per week. You can guess at the page density. So whether it's an academic journal article or a textbook, difficulty, no new concepts, many new concepts, um, and it will give you an estimation of how long these common academic tasks take. Again, no system is perfect, but it's a helpful place to start when you're thinking about designing for inclusion. Okay. Recognizing that there are many ways to accommodate many different situations, I want us to do some brainstorming together. I'm going to minimize and stop sharing my screen so that we can see Zoom. So y'all are going to be center stage in terms of the chat. I want us to think collaboratively about some ways that we can accommodate for accommodations that sometimes are traditionally tricky um, to make happen in our systems. So how might we accommodate if a student needs an accommodation for extra time, but it's not possible? So for example, you may have an assignment that is due at the start of class, and you cannot take anything after the start of class because you're going to give feedback right away. You're going to tell them what the right answer is. What might we do there? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use breakout rooms in Zoom, and then I'm going to have you all chat amongst yourselves to think about what are some things that we could do. Does anybody online or in the room have an idea that they might want to share for how we can accommodate 
for a need for extra time when we have a hard line that we cannot move beyond. I'm gonna throw the squawk box over here, I'll pass it. I don't trust myself with it. I don't trust myself to catch it. <laughs> um, so I actually have this uh, like of extra time for my yeah. disabilities. Um, so what one of my teachers did was I would have her class and then another professor and then I'd have a break time. So she would wait until my break time for me to submit, but I was able to work on it during class as well. Excellent. So, yeah. So baking time into classroom where we can. Yes. Love it. Other ideas. Yes. Oh, I'm not going to throw there's too many coffee cups. I kind of have a bunch because this is my Love it. daily job. Bring it on. Um, but some of the stuff that we kind of encourage professors, um, looking at how much is actually worth in the syllabus and if it's something that they can just get feedback on rather than actually be graded on and that grade could be added on to something else. Yeah. Um, that's something that's very common. Um, if they need extra time, typically they're doing that outside of the classroom anyway. So having them start before everybody else so then they can return back to class at the same time and then be able to kind of participate at the same time. Um, there's also some room there for maybe looking at like an adapted um, assessment just for them if they want to stay in the classroom and work within that time constraint. So if it is a student that struggles with multiple choice, maybe you give them one short answer question instead or something like that. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of where we would usually go. Love it. I love the idea. <laughs> Remembering that we're always kind of looking for flex. So if you can move the start time to give extra time, that can be really helpful. That's what it can be challenging premise that challenging the premise that you can't give extra time by just giving it to them earlier. Yeah. Do we have ideas coming from online, making it accessible prior, love it, making it participation-based? Absolutely. Oh. Now I feel like you're just testing my catching abilities. That's all right. No, it's good. My step count, I gotta get So uh, while I was teaching one of the courses in management science, um, there was a very sharp student and he has a uh, certain disability. So my technique was giving him extra time after the lecture. He needed some clarifications on the using different kinds of software and he was kind of overwhelmed with the, with the class. So uh, give him time directly after the lecture. That I love technique. it. Yeah. So making the time. Yeah. Love it. Thank you. Some, um, oh. on, online, Megan, we have uh, Carolyn, uh, who's suggesting allow students to only do a certain number of them, these quizzes or assignments, so do 10 of 15, so they can drop low grades or skip, skip ones uh, that they don't get done without any penalty. I love it. Drop policies are another really great way to do this, and it also can be done universally. So um, again, thinking about systems, I used to call this UDL. I've been um, gotten feedback from a reviewer that really what we're talking about here is flexible design. So when you talk about UDL, sometimes it brings in really fixed ideas about the types of flexibility you're talking about. But what we're talking about here is flexibility in terms of submissions. Um, and when we have a drop policy, it benefits all students, right? So if you miss the bus, if, you know, a loved one dies, if something horrible has happened, or if something amazing has happened, like we often talk about like this in the context of sometimes bad things happen, which is really important, obviously, but also sometimes students may be winning an award. It can help to reduce concerns about needing to be missing some requirements. I think there was another hand. Yes. Um, this is weird. Um, I don't really have a question. I have more so of a comment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, with accommodations, obviously, all students would, you know, prefer it, but not necessarily want it. Yep. So in those contexts, what would you suggest, like, maybe for a professor to do? Because, like, you know, the first thing you want to ask a student personally is, you know, what do you feel that I can do for you? Yeah. Because, you know, sometimes most people with disabilities love their independence. Yeah. And if you impede on that independence or make them feel slightly less included because, you know, they may need something extra and sometimes that's not really what they want they prefer to just be that normal student that's doing everything what everyone wants yeah so in that case what do you do or like what do you work around that or good question this is where systems i think come into place so at queens we've um, adopted a computer system that was originally designed for carlton um 
students, I've got seven minutes left. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna run, but I'm gonna answer your question first. So what we actually have is a system where students, I never know that a student has an accommodation unless they tell me. So it is a system where I wouldn't put anything into place. So we also use D2L, Brightspace, we call it on cue because that's what we do um, to make things confusing. But like, I would never go in and add extra time until a student says, I want you to apply this for me. So really empowering the student to be the driver of when accommodations come in or not. There's challenges with that system too. Um, I'll be honest. So it's really tough for me as an instructor if a student um, understandably has a flare, you know, two hours before an exam, and then I need to go in and make adjustments into the learning management system at that point, it can be really tough. That's when we think about designing for what if that happens, because the reality is a condition can flare. So we think about things like, are there policies for an automatic reweighting? Are there policies for deferred exams? Um, things of that nature. So it's really thinking about kind of the if then, which actually sets up with what I'm going to talk about for the last couple of minutes. So I'm going to send you in the chat to my website. Again, sounds super horrible. It's only because it's the only way I could figure out to get you access to a file. So I just put it in the chat. And for those of you who have a computer here, um, you can navigate to this. I'm going to accept my cookies. I don't know what they are, but that's okay. If you scroll down to the bottom, and I'm going to apologize, I totally spelt um, my colleague Tara's last name wrong with two W's and she laughed at me, um, but I can't figure out how to fix it. This is part of the challenge is that sometimes we are not super tech savvy, but you can download and open an Excel file. I'm going to encourage you to click over to the first page. For those of you who are here, can you, can I get your help? I actually printed out a version of the first page. If you can just pass those out, that would be lovely. Thank you. As you're preparing and designing your courses, I encourage you, let me share my screen so you guys see what I'm talking about here. I encourage you to really think intentionally about, maybe not your course title, it's probably given to you, but do think intentionally about what are your prereqs? So can you make an assumption about essential requirements? Think about learning hours if those are provided to you. Do you have a mandate for three hours per week face-to-face? -face? Do you have a mandate for 120 learning hours per semester? Do you have flexibility in terms of how that's allocated? So if you're interested in running a flipped classroom, let's say, do you have the authority to do that within the context of your course? Thinking about course description, this may be provided to you through an academic calendar, through the institution. And then thinking intentionally about what your course learning objectives are. And we can talk about learning objectives. I'm gonna give my bias here. The scientist Megan hates learning outcomes and learning objectives. I cannot find any empirical evidence that they help facilitate students learning better. I'm looking for a nice two by two design where we manipulate if students are taught how to use learning outcomes, um, yes or no versus if they're provided yes or no. But I do think that from a systems perspective, they're very valuable. They make explicit what it is that we want to cover and what it is that we're doing here. Also thinking about unwritten essential requirements. Once you have these in hand and the sheet that's going around, you can then start to think about how would I assess this? Maybe you're gonna have a midterm test. Maybe you're gonna have weekly quizzes. Maybe they're gonna be formative. Maybe they're participation-based recognizing that participation-based grading can also be a barrier um, unless we have things like drop policies in place. You can think about whether you're assessing your learning outcomes or not. And then once you have kind of that background thinking in place, you can then start to think about if then thinking is what I'm gonna call this. Again, I'm gonna use Queen's terminology because I have access to the inner workings of that system. But I encourage you to think about the assessments the due dates that you have. You can have a description, if you will. Learning outcomes assessed, which really is kind of a systems thing. Universal adjustments that may be possible. Requires extra time on quizzes. What are you gonna do? 
So if a student needs 15 minutes per hour, can you do that? Maybe it's as simple as input extra time into on cue. Maybe it's connect with Fred Smither Center because they're going to help me in terms of booking a room. What's going to happen if it can't take a quiz or exam at a specific time of day? Are there academic integrity concerns? And sometimes there are. If you're concerned about, um, you know, there was a great question um, for those of you who know Ron Holden, uh, a question called, it was just wither personality, question mark. Um, and so that type of, you may know this question, um, it, it's a question that would be very easily shared. So do you need to have different versions of the exam? Not just to protect the integrity of um, the assessment, but I'm gonna argue it also protects our students who need accommodation. So people often view accommodations as making something less rigorous or, oh, that's you know accommodated so much it doesn't assess what it's intended to. That's not true at all. And I think part of it is really advocating for the thoughtfulness behind how we design our assessments and assess to bring a reassurance to everybody that this is still important, rigorous work that's happening. Um, I'll encourage you to scroll over. I'm getting the stop sign, so I'm gonna stop here, um, but you'll see that there's lots of different common accommodations that we see. I do not focus on the physical built space because it's often something as instructors, we don't have the power to have a uh, change over, uh, but you can certainly add more to this. So I will stop there. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Megan. Awesome. Thank you so much, Megan. That was really interesting. Um, I just wanted to know in your experience, you know, I'm looking at this chart and I'm thinking in a perfect world, every professor is filling that out in advance and having these summertime thoughts. Um, but I think we both know that in reality that doesn't happen. Um, in your experience, you know, how have you been able to assist the buy-in from the academic side of the, of the institution? The Department of Psychology at Queens invested in this system. We hired a staff person who um, actually has, I don't know if, if SMU has gone like teams, like enthusiastic. Every course now has a Microsoft Teams account that the instructors and designated TAs are in along with our accommodations LMS person. They build this if then statement. And then uh, the instructors build the if then statement, double check that the staff person understands it. And the staff person now manages all communications for classes that opt into it, right. which has significantly reduced email volume for instructors. And students report significant satisfaction increases because they're getting consistent feedback and information from somebody whose sole job it is to provide that accessibility. So that's a systems thing at the department level that we were really able to facilitate. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, yeah. yeah, thanks. 